Hello everyone, welcome to part two of the Bioshock Iceberg. I was blown away by the attention that the first video received and it single-handedly launched my YouTube channel, which I hope to develop much more over the coming months. Now, as many of you pointed out to me, the Bioshock series is a treasure trove of mystery, and my initial video tried its best to capture everything, but the game was rigged from the start because I'm only one man. So, not to worry, I've brought in help. In fact, I've brought in an expert. No, in fact, I've brought in THE expert. Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you none other than the Bioshock Hub. Hello everyone, I've explored the deepest depths of Rapture and Columbia's highest peaks, so I'm glad I can help out however I can. Now, the two of us have spent some time creating new entries, going over the ones contributed in the comments by you all, and the ones found on other iceberg charts and figuring out exactly where they fall on this master iceberg. We wanted no sea slug left unturned. But before we get into the new entries, I have a few corrections to make to the first video, as well as some elaborations some of you made in the comments that I'd like to point out. So I'll fire those off real quick. Lutess. It's the Lutess twins. I'm sorry for my mispronunciation. It's Lutess, I understand. Thank you. World War I facial injuries. There's an actual scholarly essay about the use of real faces for the Bioshock splicers, which is pretty darn convenient for me because I thought it was a great potential video. So this essay by Susanna Birnoff is a great place for me to start, but you're also welcome to read it if you don't want to wait for me to make a video. Little Sister in Wall. I failed to mention that at the beginning of the first game, you can actually see the eyes of a little sister in a vent on the wall. This is before we ever see them use vents, so it's very easy to miss, but definitely a viable interpretation for this entry. Bouncer's Spear Drill I guess early bouncers could actually fire their drill like a missile and pull it back with a cable. Now I'd call that a harpoon drill, but it's definitely worth a mention. The feature seems to have been cut pretty early, as one would imagine it'd be pretty hard to implement. Religion in Rapture The Saturnine cult drinks Ambrosia, not Ambrosia. The term Ambrosia is borrowed from Greek mythology. It's also known as the food of the gods. This is despite the fact that in Bioshock it's a beverage and not a food. Saltenstall Henry Saltenstall's flayed-off scalp also makes a brief appearance in Infinite, so he is still kind of in the game. La Revancha du Jedi Booker makes a comment shortly after seeing Elizabeth open a tear for the first time. He says, This job is getting worse all the time, which could be a reference to Lando Calrissian's quote, This deal is getting worse all the time, in The Empire Strikes Back. Maybe intentional, maybe not. Desert Lighthouse The hidden space station I mentioned the first time around for this entry looks like it could possibly be Citadel Station from System Shock. That certainly makes sense to me. Toy Crab the Toy Crab is likely a leftover asset from the early design phase of Infinite, which had more mechanical, Victorian steampunk type designs. It could just be an artist wanted to sneak it in somewhere because they were fond of the look. Big Sisters In the video I stated that Eleanor was cured of being a big sister. I guess that wasn't technically correct, because the sea slug was never removed from her stomach, as there's an audio diary where she directly references it as still inside of her. I guess she was simply mentally reconditioned into being a neurotypical person again. Eve The Rapture tie-in novel describes Eve as a high-density energy substance, which fuels Adam. So that means it's probably some kind of injectable stimulant that also maybe includes some calories to fuel the plasmid. That explains why soda and coffee restore Eve, because they contain caffeine. And cigarettes contain nicotine, which is also a stimulant, so that tracks. Jack's Wrench it stands to reason that the wrench Atlas murders Elizabeth with is the same one that Jack picks up at the start of Bioshock 1, due to time and location. Honestly, that's not my headcanon though. I kind of cringe when little bits of retconning like that are done, because it's a city that's literally nothing but plumbing. There was no need to imbue the pipe wrench with narrative context, because there's probably a pipe wrench inside of every household in Rapture, because the place is made of pipes. Suchong's fate. Something I failed to mention in the first video is that Suchong's corpse appears in both Bioshock 1 and Burial at Sea, 
And the audio log we hear in Bioshock 1 recounting his death is essentially acted out in front of us in real time when we play Burial at Sea. It's one of the best bits of continuity between that game and the DLC. Gone Home There is a third connection to Bioshock in Gone Home. A ranch dressing label bears a similar design to the cover of Bioshock Infinite. Man, I love ranch. Alright, anyways, that concludes the correction section. On to the new entries. Don't pick number 77. In Bioshock Infinite, the moment with the baseball is pretty much the inciting incident of the entire game. If the police officer didn't notice the mark on Booker's hand, Booker would have probably been able to covertly sneak into Elizabeth's tower and extract her without fighting his way through thousands of hostile enemies. It seems that the Lutesses agree with the assessment as well, because they send Booker a telegram just after he arrives at Columbia, which states, Whatever you do, don't pick number 77. You can't fight destiny, I suppose. Sea of Dreams Sea of Dreams is the name of one of those really high production value CG shorts used to tease a game. In this case, it's for Bioshock 2. It's wild how many of these fall under the radar because they're usually super exciting, but once a game releases, its advertisements are somewhat forgotten. It's less than two minutes long, so I'll play it here. Take a look. Gosh, it just makes you want to play the game all over again, doesn't it? Howard Hughes Another key influence for Andrew Ryan, aside from Ayn Rand, was the real-life industrialist Howard Hughes. Hughes owned multiple businesses, ranging from film production to aircraft engineering, and he was famous for piloting an airplane around the world in only 91 hours, which was a world record at the time. Later in his life, Hughes began to decline mentally and became a fairly paranoid shut-in by the time he died of kidney failure at the age of 70. The influence in Andrew Ryan is obvious. Ryan is almost indistinguishable from Hughes in looks alone, and Andrew Ryan's extreme paranoia was one of the main factors that contributed to the rapid and aggressive nature of the Rapture Civil War. Infinite's Multiplayer Bioshock Infinite had a multiplayer mode that was cut, Actually, I found a Kotaku article about how the game's ending makes it multiplayer in the sense that the single player story was a shared experience and the players chatted online about it, but I mean, that can be said about most games. So as it stands, Bioshock 2 is the only one with an official multiplayer. The Lutes twins are quantumly entangled. This entry implies that the Lutesses themselves are quantumly entangled, which is why they're so inseparable throughout the events of Bioshock Infinite. The wiki states that they're first able to come in contact by manipulating entangled atoms, but the atoms in question could have come from their own bodies. They theorize that Elizabeth is able to manipulate tears because her finger, more specifically her pinky, was cut off and left in her home dimension, giving her a physical anchor across realities. Perhaps a similar type of entanglement is responsible for the Lutessa's discovery of tears in the first place. If both of them were performing experiments on themselves at the same time, it may have created the first interdimensional tear. Mobile game. Bioshock 1 had a port to mobile phones in 2010, which has since been pulled from app stores. 
It was a bit uh, stripped down, but fairly faithful recreation of the game's story. However, it was pretty universally panned, because you're playing a 3D shooter on a phone, and that experience will never be anything like a PC or console, so I'm sorry to the poor souls that had to first experience the game this way. Code Yellow Code Yellow is another trigger phrase that has been programmed into Jack by Dr. Su Chong. It caused periodic heart spasms, which slowly weakened Jack over time, reducing his maximum health. Fontaine uses the phrase after Jack is cured of the effects of the phrase, Would You Kindly, by Tenenbaum. Jack cures himself entirely from Fontaine's influence by consuming two doses of Lot 192, a mind control antidote developed by Su Chong as an insurance policy to prevent it from being used on himself or Fontaine. Sinclair and Alexander in Bioshock 1 I can't find anything on the wiki that says these characters appear in Bioshock 1, the game, but they do both appear in the novel Bioshock Rapture by John Shirley, which does help place them on the timeline before, during, and after the events of Bioshock 1. However, there is a Sinclair Solutions sign, which can be seen in Bioshock 1. At the time, this was probably just a developer tossing a name into Rapture to give it some variety beyond, you know, Ryan Industries and Fontaine Futuristics, but Bioshock 2 took this idea and ran with it. The Siege of Columbia board game. This one's pretty self-explanatory. Bioshock Infinite had a board game spin-off in which players would choose factions, either the Vox Populi or the Founders, and they would play 60-90 to 90 minute games in which they would fight for control over Columbia. Assassinating leaders, stealing resources, and demolishing strongholds are all mechanics of the game. It currently has a 6.7 out of 10 rating on BoardGameFreak.com, so I'm going to take that to mean that if you like Infinite a lot, you'll probably enjoy it. But I'm sure there are other board games out there that utilize the concept better. Fontaine Easter Egg in Bendy and the Ink Machine in Bendy and the Ink Machine, there's an appointment chart which shows an assortment of names which are references to various media. The one we're after, though, is right there at 1015. It's F. Fontaine. How'd that get in there? I also have to add on these other instances of Bioshock references in other media. This helpful little comment thread in the first video describes the Bioshock Easter eggs found in StarCraft II, We Happy Few, and Fallout New Vegas. So thank you all for that. Clash in the Clouds Splicer Bioshock Infinite's first DLC was a series of challenge maps dubbed Clash in the Clouds. After progressing through all four levels and purchasing every upgrade in the game, you're given a secret ending in which Elizabeth is able to open a tear inside the game's hub labeled Puddle. But the puddle in question is actually from Rapture, and it brings with it a splicer, which was likely a tease for the other DLCs taking place in Rapture, that being Burial at Sea Episode 1 and Episode 2. Su Chong's Death Date There's a lot that makes Su Chong's death date not make sense when compared between Bioshock 1 and Burial at Sea. Primarily the fact that Burial at Sea implies his death is taking place in 1959, just one year before Jack's arrival in Rapture. Yet in that time, supposedly every big daddy has become bonded to their respective little sisters, despite nobody being around to continue his research, as it was already after the collapse of Rapture. It just kind of doesn't make sense. Bioshock 1 implies that the big daddy that killed Su Chong was the first ever bonded with a little sister, and a cut audio diary from 2 would have confirmed that he was killed by Subject Delta protecting Eleanor through their pair bond. But Burial at Sea just kind of inserts this whole lion with a thorn in its paw idea, and honestly that seems way too situational and sudden, to be responsible for chemically bonding every little sister and big daddy in Rapture simultaneously. It's just kind of clunky and out of place in the timeline that we understand, so it's further evidence that the Burial at Sea DLCs take place in an alternate Rapture from the first game we played. Constants and variables, right? The Rapture Zoo Very little is known about the concept of the Rapture Zoo. It was a cut section of Fort Frolic from Bioshock 1. It has a piece of concept art and is cited as one of the features that the developers most regret needing to cut from the final game. 
In an interview that I conducted with Ken Levine, he revealed that the purpose of the zoo was to show the effects of plasmids on animals and would have likely featured some kind of monkey or gorilla. Sinclair videos. Hidden in the files of Bioshock 2, there are these unsettling videos of Sinclair strapped to a chair. Conceivably, they were supposed to be used in an alternate cutscene or perhaps death to Sinclair's character, but they have a very distinct and odd vibe for what they are. The videos are the same aspect ratios as the TV screens in Rapture though, so it's assumed that they would have played there rather than being a full-on cutscene, which maybe explains why their emotion and graininess makes them feel so unusual. The Sinclair Atlas Voice Connection You already know that Atlas has an Irish accent and Sinclair has a southern one. But originally, Atlas had a southern accent in the first game, but it was changed when it was discovered that playtesters found the voice untrustworthy. With that knowledge in mind, it's likely that the voice was chosen for Sinclair in order to create an initial distrust between him and the player. They kind of reverse engineered the Atlas twist to make the player go from suspecting Sinclair to trusting him, and then they decided to rip our fucking hearts out. Fallout and Bioshock Connected This theory states that Bioshock and Fallout could share a universe, because Andrew Ryan chose to build Rapture in response to the Allies' use of nuclear weapons to bomb Hiroshima and Nagasaki in World War II. This is the same point in time, roughly, where the history of the Fallout universe diverges significantly from the real history of the United States. Rapture saw advancements in robotics, genetic engineering, and artificial intelligence, and all of those are commonplace in the Fallout universe. Perhaps the disappearance of the great thinkers and artists to Rapture is what incited the Fallout timeline to branch off from our own. So maybe some of Rapture's technologies weren't as localized as we once thought. But this theory has a lot of holes. Obviously, you've got the differences in developer and creative team. That pretty swiftly clarifies that this certainly wasn't the intention in regards to these two games. And as headcanon, well, maybe it could work if you don't look at the lore of both games too carefully. And if you ignore it gone home as Bioshock canon, despite it having much stronger developer connections, then I guess this theory could work. But frankly, both games have very, very comprehensive lore, so I'm sure there are several ways that this theory can be disproven. Fontaine's real name. Frank Fontaine isn't really Frank Fontaine. In fact, his last name isn't well known. In the book Bioshock Rapture, it is revealed that Frank Fontaine was originally an orphan turned con man who used a number of different aliases, his favorite being Frank Gorland, but he also used the names Barris, Wiston, Moskowitz, and Wang. For the sake of convenience, I'm just going to call him Frank Gorland. The real Frank Fontaine was a smuggler whose services were used to assist Andrew Ryan in the construction of Rapture through his front, Fontaine Fisheries. Gorland learned about the construction of Rapture and followed the trail all the way up to the real Fontaine, who he killed and assumed the identity of gaining his ticket to Rapture and laying the groundwork for his eventual plan to take over the underwater city. Cut Bioshock 2 intros. There were two major components to the original Bioshock 2 intro, which were scrapped at some point during development. Originally, the intro was meant to mirror the intro to Bioshock 1 showing the Welcome to Rapture sequence as it appeared during New Year's Eve in 1958 in pristine condition, at the first big outbreak of the Rapture Civil War. This intro would then transition into a playable level where the player took control of Subject Delta, defending Eleanor Lamb in the Kashmir restaurant during the New Year's Eve bombings. At some point, Delta would be mortally wounded and wake up 10 years after the events of the first game. The final game, of course, only has an animated intro, which has a similar ending, but takes place in the Adonis Luxury Resort. Luminescent Biomass The luminescent biomass is a mysterious source of energy beneath Rapture that glows a cool blue color. It is known to be responsible for mutating the native sea slugs, which create Adam. The only reference to it in-game was an audio diary from Harold Parsons, who remarks that he feels watched by things on the outside implying that the biomass is somehow sentient. This is very fertile ground for theorizing, however. Part HP Lovecraft and part 2001, A Space Odyssey. Mind in Revolt. I can't believe I didn't come across this one when I was researching the first video. 
This is actually a really cool novel that connects to the narrative of Bioshock Infinite. It was written by Joe Fielder with the help of Ken Levine himself to explore the backstory of Columbia, serving as a prequel to Infinite. Truth from Legend, Fact from Myth Truth from Legend, Fact from Myth is a series of short documentary-style clips that appear to be from an obscure television program from the 1970s. These videos seem to explore the possibility of an underwater city, as the explanation for the disappearances of so many great figures in the 1940s and 50s. They were created as an ad campaign for Infinite's Burial at Sea DLCs. Sally, Booker's adopted rapture daughter, even appears as an adult in one of them. The thinker is Shodan. Now this is a theory with a strong leg to stand on. The Thinker's full name is actually Rodin, Rapture Operational Data Interpreter Network. Shodan is the main antagonist of the System Shock series, Sentient Hyper Optimized Data Access Network. So there's some consistency in the name convention and function of those two systems. We know Bioshock almost certainly takes place in the System Shock universe, so it stands to reason that the Thinker could be an early iteration of the supercomputer system known as Shodan in System Shock. There's nothing to disprove or dispute that. Charles Milton Porter even makes it to the surface with some of the Thinker's code. This is absolutely my headcanon. It definitely feels like the Thinker's AI was the basis for Shodan's. Dead Cats. This entry is one of those things that you won't be able to unsee during your next playthrough of Bioshock. For some reason, Rapture is filled with various dead cats, which serves as almost set decoration for the underwater city. This presence raises a lot of questions. Did people bring their cats to Rapture? Did they somehow manage to stow away on a bathysphere and invade the city as an invasive species? If there were pets, why are there no dogs, birds, or other common house pets in Rapture? Surely the wealthy residents would have insisted on bringing their prized animals down with them. But whatever their reason for being there, why are they all dead? Do splicers hate cats and hunt them ruthlessly? One would imagine that felines would be adept survivalists in a disheveled city such as Rapture. So what would cause the entire population of house cats to die in random areas all over Rapture? It's as if they all suddenly drop dead. This is such a bizarre detail with no obvious in-universe explanation. Infinite's Hidden Music Some of the ambient noise used in Bioshock Infinite is actually music. When the sounds are sped up significantly, they become a woman singing in a haunting, repeating melody. However, the words she sang are somewhat unclear. Some claim to hear a reference to drowning, which perhaps foreshadows the end of the game, but the singing is haunting, which is why this entry is so far down. I'll link a video in the description that shows all of the sounds sped up, and it's quite unnerving, so listen to that if you're into it. Whew. Wow, alright, that concludes part two of the Bioshock Iceberg. I think that should do it, at least until the fourth game comes out. It took a while for the comments of the first video to produce so many new entries, and frankly, it took even longer for me to get my life together to make this video. I'm probably going to branch out from Bioshock after this, so if you want more purely Bioshock content, please check out the Bioshock Hubs channel. Yeah, I do a lot of deep dives into all three games. Everything from detailed recaps of the lesser-known stories found in audio diaries and voxophones, walkthroughs of the game, live streams, and I also have a pretty exciting interview with Ken Levine himself if you want to check it out. If you want to see more Bioshock, then definitely be sure to head over to my channel. I would greatly appreciate it, and I would love to have you over there. I 100% support that statement. If you're going to learn, then you better learn from the best. It was an honor having your help for this video. Thank you. The honor was all mine. And until next time, I hope you all have a wonderful day. Thank you all for watching. Let us know your thoughts in the comments. I'm sure we're both very excited to read them and goodbye.